All right, I think we are up and running. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, bear with me. It's a little bit different environment from uh, what we've done in years past and it, uh, it looks a little different for, from this end too. Uh, my name is Patrick Reed. I am the uh, Public and Government Affairs Manager for the Washington Secretary of State Corporations and Charities Division. Um, today I will be uh, going through uh, some very basic information about uh, getting started in Washington and um, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to answer a few of your questions along the way as well. So starting off with the, uh, the, the presentation part, um, matter of fact, we can even jump into the next slide here. Um, I'll just dive into a little bit of information about what it is we do at the Secretary of State's office. Uh, the key point is we register 70% of all new businesses in the state of Washington. Um, anything that is not a sole proprietor or uh, most general partnerships, the, they will register with our office and they'll start with our office as their, as their first filing point. Next item is that we're, uh, hold, we hold the public record for all legal entities. Again, anything other than a sole proprietorship and most general partnerships. Um, I've listed a CD on there just as a reminder as a controlling document. A uh, controlling document represents when you go to work with banks, uh, lenders, um, grant giving organizations, they're going to look for the controlling document, which is actually your public record with Secretary of State's office as their primary source of uh, general business information. Uh, corporate and business law apply to most everything uh, other than a sole proprietorship or general partnerships. Uh, what I mean by that is a lot of people think of corporation or an LLC as just another type of license. Go sign up for it and you're good to go. Uh, it is much more in depth than that. Uh, in most cases, it is you, once you file your articles of incorporation, you have just entered corporate law. And in order for that to work correctly for the business and in, in the way that it's intended, there are a lot of other steps uh, beyond just filing papers that need to be uh, taken care of. I'll address a few of those as we go through here, um, but really in a lot of the cases, it's something that you have to seek legal advice or some type of a uh, trusted advisor. Next slide, please. So the, the types of registrations that we do, uh, profit corporations, uh, nonprofit corporations, limited liability companies, and limited partnerships. Uh, limited partnerships have multiple designations depending on the type of structure that you're, you're intending and the type of partners that you have, whether they be uh, general, limited, and so on. Um, and again, you, you'll hear me say this a lot, is you want to seek the advice of a uh, uh, trusted legal advisor or seek legal counsel. Um, even if it's just a consult, it's something we often recommend. Next slide, please. So the types of documents that we file, uh, formation documents, which would be your articles of incorporation or your certificate of formation for an LLC. Those are the creation document that actually starts the whole process. And based on completion of that, you're also going to receive your UBI number. Uh, for, the, for anybody that's not aware, the UBI number is a uh, unified business identifier. It's a nine digit number that's assigned to you that carries through with all the other state agencies and allows you to use that one number to identify your company in most cases. Um, other types of documents include amendments. If you're ever making changes to your uh, articles of incorporation or your certificate of formation, uh, that would be done through filing an amendment. Um, a merger is when you have more than one business coming together, yet one of them is gonna be a survivor and the other one is not. Uh, conversions are when a business decides to uh, legally change its structure. So you would go from a corporation to an LLC or, a, um, or vice versa or a corporation to a limited partnership. One legal entity can, one profit legal entity can convert into another type of legal entity uh, with the exception of nonprofits. A nonprofit cannot become a profit and vice versa. Um, in those situations, we, we again, uh, seek legal counsel. Um, the big message for mergers and conversions is that a sole proprietor 
under no circumstance can convert to become a profit corporation or an LLC. Uh, it's important when you're starting off that you um, look down the road uh, five to 10 years on what type of structure you want to be and plan accordingly uh, because it's not something that you can, you cannot just convert or refile. In the, in the case of switching from a sole proprietor to an LLC, you actually have to close one and reopen another from scratch, which especially if you have employees, uh, that can be problematic because you may have things like your employment uh, histories or employment ratings and things that could end up costing you more money by starting over. Um, another popular item or, or very important item is the annual reports. Each year on the anniversary month of your filing, you have to file an informational annual report. It's, uh, it's basically a reaffirmation of your, um, your registered agent information, which I'll get to here in a moment. Uh, who's, th who are the governors for the organization, the ones that are making decisions, um, and general contact information. Um, and I, I'll have more information on further slides as well. And we'll. We can go to the next one, please. So some things to consider when you're planning on uh, creating a legal entity. Uh, one of them is, have you decided to structure? Uh, that's the big question. Should I be a, a corporation? Should I be an LLC? Uh, why, where does limited partnership come in? Um, you have to identify something that fits your business, fits your uh, tax obligations, and addresses your liabilities. Uh, and do we cannot advise that on, on how to do it. It is legal advice and, and we do seek people, we encourage people to seek legal advice when making that final determination. We will make it very easy for you to file and get everything started. That, that's not a problem, but when it comes to actually doing the, the legwork behind the scenes and the legal advice, that has to be ready to go by the time you get to the Secretary of State's office. Uh, another one is, uh, have you generated bylaws or uh, for a corporation or operating agreement for an LLC? These are internal documents that while they're not required to file with our office when you're starting the entity, it's something that the banks and lenders and partners are often gonna wanna see. Those are the things that outline what you do, the way that you do it, who's in charge of making decisions and what happens to the money that you bring in. Those are things that are outlined in your bylaws and in your operating agreement. And it's very important to have those ready to go as part of your, your startup process because it's likely you're going to be asked for them very early in the, in the game. Uh, another thing to consider is the business name uh, must be distinguishable from anything else registered with the Secretary of State. Um, there, there are multiple ways to, to check for name availabilities and the different jurisdictions that hold ownership over names. Uh, I recommend the starting point being with the Secretary of State's office. When you search the Secretary of State's website, you'll get a good general indication of whether or not that name is used or available. Uh, oftentimes, you'll also get the, a listing of the similar one, similar names and be able to identify what adjustment you might need to make from what you were intending. Uh, other people often suggest checking with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, uh, which is a great idea to do no matter what uh, at some point in the game, uh, because you want to make sure that even though a name may be available with Secretary of State's office, it may not be available as, on a federal trademark level uh, or even a state trademark level. Um, there are a number of ways that, that names can be um, become proprietary to a business um, and not be available for a new business starting up. Next slide, please. Uh, registered agent. This is another one that a lot of people overlook in the, in the startup process. Registered agent uh, must be a physical address in the state of Washington. It cannot be a PO box. It cannot be a uh, postal box. It cannot be a, um, uh, I think it's a uh, UPS and some other stores offer those, the, you know, business addresses and things like that, none of those qualify as a registered agent. A registered agent must be a physically identified uh, address through the U.S. Post Office. Um, and it is something where somebody is supposed to be available during normal business hours to receive service or process on your behalf. So essentially, if your legal entity, so a corporation or LLC, 
you're either getting a legal notification or you're being served papers, then those are gonna to go to your registered agent. No matter what else you have listed in your documents, that is the starting point and that is the requirement for court. If, if you're going to court for something, um, if they've served your registered agent, that is proper service. Um, some other things to consider, uh, corporations and LLCs have an option to uh, designate with the IRS. Um, people often hear about S Corp or C Corp status. And I apologize, I just, sorry, I apologize. I'm, I'm still uh, adjusting to the chat uh, process here. So I do have a chat that I'll address here in a few minutes. Um, so uh, corporations and LLCs have uh, tax status that they have to address with the IRS. It's not recognized at the state level, whether you're a S Corp or a C Corp means nothing to us. S Corp or C Corp is actually the federal designation of whether or not you're being taxed individually as a business and as, an, as a person, or as, the C Corp is if your business is being taxed separately. If you're just receiving all the money and claiming it on your individual income taxes, that is an S Corp. And again, that is nothing that's registered with Secretary of State and it's nothing that's uh, recognized at the state level as I understand, uh, it's purely IRS and federal. Um, governing persons or governors, as you'll see in, in the, the formation documents, have 120 days to be reported to the Secretary of State. So when you file your origination documents, you have the option to file your governors at the same time. If you choose to file at a later time, uh, it's, a, it's a $10 filing fee, but you can submit your officers within, excuse me, your governors within 120 days. And the definition of a governor is essentially anybody that's been uh, or that's vested with authority to act on behalf of the business. In the past, that used to be called officers, directors, uh, CEO, uh, vice president, president, things like that. All of those terms and titles roll up under the term governor. Uh, so if you're listed as a governor, it means you're one of 13 things. Next slide, please. Uh, why file with Secretary of State first? Uh, this is a big question that we get a lot of the times. Uh, to start off with is entity recognition. Uh, if, you, if your goal is to be a corporation or an LLC, it doesn't matter anything you've done with other agencies, IRS or anybody else. And if you have not filed with the Secretary of State, you do not exist. Uh, it, it's very simple. You do not have standing with the courts. Um, and you are, you do not exist as a legal entity until that public record is filed with Secretary of State's office. I mentioned in the beginning about the controlling document factor with the public record. And that's another example of you, if you have not registered properly and created your LLC or corporation properly, you do not have standing in the court to sue uh, on behalf of that LLC. You can still be sued, but you do not have the right to take action. Um, the entity name, again, uh, we talked a little bit before about the, uh, the entity name. It, it's twofold. One is identifying what you're going to select and use as your legal name, which will follow you through the life of the, the company unless you file an amendment to change it. And with that uh, legal entity name is uh, whenever you're doing banking, um, banking, loans, contracts, things like that, it's going to fall back to your, your entity name. And once you're registered with the Secretary of State's office, you then own that name uh, as far as the Secretary of State. Uh, you, we do not duplicate names um, and that becomes yours at that point and no additional ones will be filed. Where people get confused sometimes is they mix up the trade names or registered trade names at Department of Revenue. The entity name is the legal name of the business trade names that are filed with secretary or excuse me with department of revenue are actually the common terminology is doing business as name but in washington it's called a registered trade name which is additional names that you're recognized as and i i believe there may be some more uh brief information on that here in, in a little bit uh, another reason to file with Secretary of State first is uh, we will issue your UBI number. Uh, once you've completed your corporation or your LLC documents and they've been completed, you'll also be issued a UBI number. That UBI number then becomes the pure number of your business that you then take to other agencies 
and use that in all your subsequent filings. Next slide, please. Uh, potential problems. Uh, there are a few, although we've made great strides in improving that uh, in partnership with Department of Revenue over the last several years. Uh, there's something called an unregistered entity. Uh, in the event a business is able to obtain a business license as with a designation as a corporation or LLC, uh, that does not make you a corporation or LLC. Um, only the Secretary of State's public record filing and controlling document makes you a corporation or an LLC. Um, what we've in the past, we used to have a lot of them that were registered tax paying businesses that were uh, had their business license and everything else, but never filed with Secretary of State's office. And that creates a lot of problems in the long run as far as uh, liabilities and taxations. A quick example that I give is uh, there was a company a few years back that um, they had a business license as a LLC, had do, been doing very well in their business. They signed a contract with a vendor to supply them a $1.7 million in product. Um, that vendor defaulted uh, on that contract order. The LLC attempted to sue them uh, for the, the lost uh, deposit money, I believe it was. Um, and it was dismissed almost immediately because they didn't have standing to bring suit. They didn't matter that they had a business license as an LLC or any other documentation. The, the pure fact that they didn't file with Secretary of State meant that they did not exist. Uh, another one um, keep in mind is inconsistent information. Um, the legal entity filings, whenever you're doing an update or an annual report or anything that has to do with your legal entity, it has to be done through the Secretary of State's office through a public record filing. Um, doing a business license change or a post office address change or any other type of change document or filing with any other agency does not affect your legal entity. The only legal entity change that counts is when you're filing that public record with Secretary of State. Next slide, please. A uh, few things to remember as we're going through. Um, registered agent, again, it must be kept current at all times in uh, post office and BLS address changes do not apply like we were just talking about. Again, the registered agent needs to be a physical address in the state of Washington. Um, <coughs> excuse me, a second part of that is keep in mind, everything filed with Secretary of State's office is public record and available um, not only on the website, but on records request. So if you're going to be your own registered agent and use your home address, it's perfectly fine. Anybody can be the registered agent, but remember that that address is then becoming public record and is searchable on the web. Uh, if people will often use the business address, uh, but in many cases, the business address is also the home address. If that's the case and you do not want to use uh, that as your public record, then you can also um, hire companies called service companies that will serve as your registered agent at the bare minimum just to receive your, pro your service of process and forward it to you. And you can al they can also provide additional services that you can negotiate with them on just being registered agent all the way up to filing all your annual documents and paying your taxes. Most of them have multiple lines of service. Uh, it's just an option out there if you do not wish to use your own uh, home address for the public record. Uh, annual report notices are electronic. Um, so that's a transition we've been going through is we're moving to a electronic only notification. Um, everybody is automatically going to be opted in for that when they file an, uh, a new entity. The, well, or excuse me, they're, there's going to be the option when, when you file uh, to opt in for the email delivery. And once that is selected, then you're going to get email notifications for your annual report notices um, and any other type of uh, typical notification that we would be sending out. That's totally separate from the registered agent uh, service of process. This is regarding your secretary of state notices. Uh, for example, your reminder to file your annual report. Next slide, please. So a few things to remember after you file. Uh, after you, so filing initial reports. So I'd mentioned this earlier, your report of um, governors is you can file it at the time of origination 
or you can um, delay that and come back within 120 days and file it. Just don't miss your 120 days because then you go into a delinquency and or a possible dissolution process. So there are some options there, but you have to remember either do it at the time of filing or do it later on or, or do it within 120 days. File the annual report. This is the biggest mistake that businesses make. Uh, annual report is due by the last day of the anniversary month. If you file in February, then every last day of February, you are due to have your annual report turned in. Uh, if you don't, you go into delinquent status, which does two things. There's only a, tw there's a $25 penalty for it, but it means that you cannot get a status of uh, good standing or a certificate of a, or a certificate of good standing or anything that sh shows that you are current. It's going to show you as delinquent. Uh, banks, lenders, contractors, things like that have problems with the, with not being current. Um, during that 120 days, you have every opportunity to get it brought back to current. At the end of that 120 days, if you have not taken care of it, then you are administratively dissolved. If you are administratively dissolved, then not only do you have uh, no status as far as being able to prove to your uh, business partners and workers that are the people that you work with <coughs> that you're in existence, but your name also becomes available at that point. Once you're administratively dissolved, if there's somebody really wanting your name and they catch it, uh, they can go in and file something with that name, a new entity with that name and it's now on you to find a new name and start over with that process, which can be problematic in a lot of ways with different agencies, uh, all of your marketing materials, uh, things like that. So it's very important. Um, put a reminder on your calendar for the same month every year to, to go in and file your annual report. It takes five minutes online and it costs $60. Uh, another one is always make sure to amend your information if changes occur. So if, um, if something changes throughout the year, for example, you have different governors or you change your uh, principal office address, things like that, you can go in and file, depending on what time of year, you can file either an amended annual report to update that information, or you can file an annual report a little bit early and carry it through the next year. Um, there, we've made them really easy to do online or on paper if you have to. Uh, the key to that is make sure your information is current because once again, it doesn't matter who you've notified out there in the business world. If it hasn't been filed in public record with Secretary of State, it does not count against your legal entity. So it's another thing to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So I've got a couple of examples here of uh, screenshots of our system. Um, and I'm looking at uh, right now is our using the CCFS as the corporations and charities filing system. In the top left is the general login section. Top right is if you've never logged in before, you can go in and create an individual user account. It takes just a couple of minutes. Um, and then right below that are options to file amended annual reports with or without changes. Those do not require a login, um, and they're, uh, th that's where I said it takes five minutes to file your annual report, and, and those are options you can use for that. Uh, below that is our search function, which you can search by um, name or by UBI number and, uh, and look at any business that's out there that's registered with Secretary of State. You have access to their full uh, supply of information. Um, next slide, please. Here's an example of uh, creating that individual user account. The one on the, the other account, the commercial registered agent, is if you are specifically going to be a commercial agent or a service company that is filing documents on behalf of other businesses, that's where you would consider becoming a commercial registered agent. Um, but it's not necessary if it's just you and your business and you're going in to get an account. Next slide, please. So once you've logged in, once you've created the account and logged in, you have a whole menu of items on the left that's going to give you uh, all of your different filing options. Uh, up along the top, you've got your dashboard, which includes your um, completed uh, filings, incomplete filings, um, you know, your dashboard, your receipts, and your uh, checkout. You also have um, right below that is a section for my subscriptions. Anybody can sign up and monitor any other business, whether it's a competitor 
whether it's just something out of curiosity, all you need to do is identify them via either business name or UBI number, and you can subscribe, and then you will be notified by email at any time they file a document. Next slide, please. So here's uh, an example of the search results. So uh, if you've done a search, whether by name or by UBI number, or, or excuse me, specifically by name, you're gonna get a whole list. The left side is the business name with a link to the profile, uh, UBI number, uh, and so on. Uh, across, if you select one of those, we'll go to the next screen. It gives you the profile of that business. It's gonna give you all the basic information about when they started, when they're due to file their annual report, um, their principal office and registered agent information. And then the most popular piece about our new system, if you go to the, go ahead to the next slide. So when you go to the, on that previous slide, we, there was a button for filing history. When you select that, it brings up the, um, the filing history results. And it's gonna give you a list of every document that was filed on behalf of that business. And on the right hand side, if you click on that link, it will actually open up that document, whether it was an electronic document or whether it was an old onion paper document from 1860, it's gonna show a visual of what, what's been filed on behalf of that company. Next slide, please. A uh, few other steps after the Secretary of State, uh, make sure you file your business license with uh, business license service at Department of Revenue um, and register those trade names as you need to or, or DBAs, we still hear a lot of people refer them to, um, but register trade names and then um, follow up with any other regulatory agency, um, and whether that be uh, labor and industries, employment security, um, environmental agencies, uh, local jurisdictions, such as cities and counties. It is the business responsibility to make sure you have all of those uh, identified and, um, and taken care of. So uh, unfortunately, there's no such thing as I didn't know when it comes to the business registration. Um, it's if you've been out there doing business without, without properly being licensed or registered, it is gonna create your problems. So that's the, oh, next slide, please. That's where I've got my contact information um, for folks that want to copy that down. I think it's gonna be in multiple places too uh, throughout the, not only as a presenter uh, for BizFair, but with um, uh, throughout the, the presentation and all that, I think my contact information's out there. Uh, I'm happy to uh, answer. Email seems to work the best to get a hold of me. Um, I do my best answer as quickly as I can. And then I have just a few minutes left to go in. Wow, I actually got that at 22 minutes. I have to I have to call them out on that because I was uh, I was on a tight leash on uh, how, how much time I had. So I'll go into a few questions via chat here. Um, I've got the chat window open. So I'll start here. Um, let me find the last physical license. Okay, so I'm reading one from um, says question for when there's uh, how do you find a business registration number if the license has expired and the person cannot find the last physical license? Uh, I tried to troubleshoot this online, uh, but could not see how to renew the license. Um, wanting to add my significant other to my PLLC and change the name of the business. So two pieces there is what it sounds like. And I'll let Tanya uh, clarify too. So, the, the PLLC itself, uh, you would make changes to that via either an amendment or an amended um, report to the Secretary of State's office. If you're changing something on your business license or professional licensing, uh, those are gonna be done at the respective agency that holds that license. Uh, Secretary of State's office does not have or issue any licenses. We are the registration for the legal entity. Um, so, uh, here's another one for DOR. Uh, it's our primary office that we register or do we register working locations? Okay. So I'm not sure. This is another question regarding a PLLC and B Corp. Uh, so a benefit corporation. So it, there, that one is, has many different tree branches that it could go into. Um, if somebody wanted to send me an email, I'm happy to try and respond to that. Uh, but that's not an easy one that we'd be able to answer here, I don't believe. Uh, next one is uh, primary office we registered. Oh, 
that's uh, a duplicate there. Uh, if you register in Washington and move to Oregon, do you dissolve the business in Washington and restart in Oregon? It's a good question. So two things. One is um, if you're if you want to keep your original registration in Washington, you don't have to reside here to do that. So if you have moved to Oregon and you're gonna be doing business in Oregon and business in Washington, then you can file as a foreign entity in Oregon. Uh, so what that means is you would be registering in Oregon to continue on your business operations from Washington state. Um, unless you're not gonna be doing anything in Washington and you just want to separate them, then yes, then you would just be starting from scratch in Oregon. Um, the other question of that is keeping a new, uh, UBI numbers are very specific to Washington state. Uh, they do not have, they do not connect to federal and they do not connect to other states. So UBI number is a Washington term. So it's really important to know the difference between a UBI and a federal ID number. Uh, and then sounds like there would, let's see, a challenger registered agent address, what did we? So I'm not clear on this other question about changing the register. If you're changing the registered agent address, that can be done two different ways. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the registered agent can be changed either when you update your um, annual report or file an amended annual report, or you can file what's called a statement of change which is a free document, takes about 30 seconds online, uh, but it counts as an official public record filing to update your registered agent. So that's what I am seeing here on questions so far. Any others that, uh, that folks would like answered. I'm just trying to scan through, make sure I'm catching them the best that I can here. And again, that one um, had many branches that feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll do my best to, to answer it that way or refer you out to the groups that are more specific for, for that. All right, well, thank you. And uh, again, I look forward to any questions that you have and I will stick around through the presentation and into um, the next uh, portion where I believe we have a, uh, an opportunity to do additional chat uh, Q&A after Tanya's uh, presentation is uh, completed. So thank you very much. Good afternoon and thank you for joining today's session. I am Tanya Dassel and I work for Department of Revenue Business Licensing Service. In today's session, I will walk you through how to utilize our services when working with the Business Licensing Service Program. The Business Licensing Service Program was created to be a one stop for business owners. We partner with more than 140 Washington cities and nine state agencies. When applying for the license, if you have employees, the application will also open your accounts for employment security and labor and industries. If you are located in Olympia, you would also apply for your city license as an example. The business structures that are not required to register with the Secretary of State first are sole proprietorship, which is one individual or married couple, a general partnership, which is two or more people, usually not a married couple. An unincorporated association, this is a group of people who share a common interest. A unified business ID, also known as a UBI, will be issued when the business license application is processed. What is a trade name? A trade name is any business name that does not contain the full legal name of the owner. It includes words which suggest additional parties of interest such as company and sons and associates. It differs from the name registered with the Office of Secretary of State in Washington. An entity name is a name that is registered with the Secretary of State. Ways you can research business names are through the Business License and Tax Business Lookup Tool this to research state and city business licenses and trade names. You can also visit the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office website. The Business License and Tax Lookup Tool can be used to look up registered trade names with the Department of Revenue, 
business names, specific UBI numbers, and license numbers. Next, we'll navigate to the home screen of the Department of Revenue's website. We'll now click into open a business. From here, we are going to look at the business license wizard. The business license wizard is a great tool for new businesses. You can get a customized guide by answering a few questions and inputting some information about the new business. This will give a new business all the information they need to start doing business in Washington. Now I'll do a demo of the wizard so you can see how it works. We'll click on start a scenario. The first page, you'll choose what your business activity will be by keying in the activity and selecting from the drop down. You can select up to five activities. As you can see, I selected contractor and then selected construction contractor. And we'll select next. This page is where you can choose what business structure the business will be. I chose sole proprietorship. Once you choose the structure to the right, it gives a description. Then you will click next. This page is where you would select if you have employees and the type of employees, including adults, minors, or both. If you will not be hiring at this time, you would select, I will not have employees. I selected adult employees today and I'll select next. The physical location page asks if you know the physical address. If you select yes, it requires the physical address of the business. If you don't know what your physical location is, you can select no and choose a city or county from the drop down menu below. I'm going to type in no today and select Mercer Island. On the other city page, you can choose multiple cities you might travel to do business in. As I stated, we partner with over 140 Washington state cities. If the city you need is not listed, you would need to contact them directly for their city license. Today, I'm going to add Tomwater and Federal Way. In a summary page includes an option to email or print the information before you apply. Since I stated my activities as a contractor, the summary lists different licenses and fees a contractor may need along with the approval time. It also included the cities we said we'd be doing business in. If we were to keep scrolling down, there is a blue apply now link that directs you to our online application in my DOR, where you can file the application directly. Below that is a more detailed version of the summary. You can click on any of the expand links to view more detailed information and links to the state partner agencies the business may need to contact. The additional resources tab provides the documents required and contact information for state agencies that we do not partner with and the business may need to contact to get started. This is to help ensure you are aware of any state requirements you may have due to your activity. You will also have the option to email the summary. This allows you to save the summary in your email for a later date to return to apply. This is a great tool to help a new business owner know who to contact for their specific type of business they plan on starting. A unified business identifier, also known as a UBI, will be issued for, the, for ownership structures that are not required to be registered with the Secretary of State. The business license application will also register your business with the Department of Revenue for sales and BNO tax, the Department of Labor and Industries for industrial insurance. Employment Security Department for the un Unemployment Insurance and Business Licensing Service for trade name registration and any renewable license that is indicated on the BLS fee sheet, including more than 140 city licensing partners. There are two ways currently to complete the application. The online application through MyDOR by going to secure.dor.wa.gov and completing the online application. The processing time for the online application is, is, is within 10 business days. Or the PC fillable document where you can print and mail into business licensing service. The paper mailed in application is processed within six weeks. Now we will navigate to the MyDOR link going to secure.dor.wa.gov, which is the first step in filling the business license application out. 
Here we will log in with our Secure Access Washington, also known as SAW, login and password. Once logged into My Idea War, you'll click into the licensing services and apply for a business license. We are now in the online application. Here we can select to start a business in Washington State if no UBI has been issued or enter in the current UBI and select next. Here are the owner stru structure types that you can select from. If the business structure type is required to register with Secretary of State, they will need to register with Secretary of State prior to filling out the application, or they will be stopped and have to go to Secretary of State and then come back. Today, we'll select sole proprietorship. We will confirm if we have a UBI in Washington State. Today, I selected no to be issued a UBI. This page confirms what is needed to file the application and select confirm. In this section, enter in the FEIN number if known and answer if you'll be hiring employees within 90 days. Answering yes to the question will add the endorsements for Employment Security Department and Labor and Industries. If language assistance is needed, select yes and then the preferred language, then select next. This is where you'll input the owner's information. Since I selected sole proprietorship, it will require the owner's last name, first name, and phone number, social security number or I-10, and the home address. After inputting the address, select the blue verify button to run it through the GIS system to verify, then select next. The next screen will ask if there's a spouse. If so, then ask for additional information pertaining to the spouse. This area is where we will provide the name of the business. Enter in the business name and select next. The next screen is for registering the trade name. If the name is anything other than the entity name or the owner's name, if a sole proprietorship, this will be also considered a trade name. For example, an alias or any nickname you use in conjunction to your business name are a trade name. You can see the system added the business name and I have the option to register additional trade names. And then select next. section is for the optional coverage for owners and officers. The questions default to no, and if you do not change, the cover will not be applied for through labor and industries. The two questions are, do you want to apply for workers' compensation coverage for owners? And do you want to apply for workers' compensation coverage for excluded employment? Select next. The physical location of the business. You can select if the address is the same as the home address or select no and enter in the physical address of where the business operates. We'll then verify the address and select next. The next slide is similar for the mailing address. If it's the same as the physical address, you will be able to select that in order to not have to rekey in the information and then select next. This section is the business information, which includes the first date of business in Washington, the estimated gross annual income, the business phone number, and email address. The following screen will ask if there's a prior business, including did you buy, lease, or acquire all or part of an existing business? Did you purchase, lease, any fixtures or equipment on which you have not paid sales or use tax? Is the business owned by, controlled by, or affiliated with any other business entity? Are you changing your business structure? Have you ever owned another business? You'll answer yes or no to the questions and then select next. This section asks if, if you will be traveling to do business in any other city than you are located in. For example, if you are a contractor and have a job in a different city than your business office, you may need additional city licenses. Select yes or no, and then select next. Here you can choose any city you may travel to do business in. BLS is partnered with more than 140 different Washington cities and towns. If your city is not listed, please contact that city directly. 
It does not mean you are not required to obtain that city license. It means it is a city that does not partner with us at this time. I'm going to add federal way today and then five and select next. You will then see the city addendum questions for the two partnering cities I selected on the previous page. Each city has different requirements on the questions asked. You can see here federal way requires the estimated gross income and the employee count in the city. Fife requires the first date of business in the city, the estimated gross income, and the number of employees working in Fife. The additional information collected by our city partners in the next section is, are you a general or specialty contractor? Do you have a Washington State professional or occupational license? Do you provide utility service? Is this business a 501c nonprofit? You would answer yes or no to the questions and then select next. This section asks what the primary business activities will be. You can select up to five activities similar to the wizard. This helps determine what state endorsements are needed. I typed in contractor and selected contractor construction and then next. If you selected your hiring employees, you will be asked the employee information, including the employment start date, the first date wages are paid, number of employees, estimated hours worked for a three month period, then the description of what the employees will do. If you are hiring employees under the age of 18, you'll be asked the age range and the duties of the minors, and then select next. You will also have the option to, to view the list of all the BLS state endorsements that we provide. When selected yes, it shows the endorsement name and descriptions that are available to apply for. Select any state endorsements that may apply to your business and then select next. This screen is an overview of all the endorsement and fees applied for on this business license application. Since I indicated we have employees and I'm traveling to different cities, you can see the employment endorsements, tax and city licenses were added with the fees that go with each endorsement. Below you can see the trade name registered and the BLS processing fee as well. The next screen will be the payment screen. Some forms to remember when applying for your business is the business license application. This is required for all ownership types. And then all other agency addendums as needed, such as your state endorsement addendums and city license addendums. Some resources we've provided are the Department of Revenue's website, dor.wa.gov, and your MyDOR login, secure.dor.wa.gov, where you can process your applications and renewals and the small business guide at business.wa.gov. Here we have our contact information, including our address, phone number, and email. With that, I would love to thank you for joining us today and open that for questions. Have a great day. Okay, with that, I'll open it up for questions. Um, I did see in the chat, we had some questions that um, my peer, Kim Johnson, has answered some. Let's see here. Um, the majority of the questions that I saw were a lot about um, non-resident uh, licenses. So the when you're traveling, subcontractors, um, if you're, I saw a, um, a mobile massage. So if you're traveling into a city, each city has a different um, requirements um, based on either income or their city code. So if you are doing business in other cities, we do partner, like we said, with um, um, all cities throughout Washington. So if you need a specific city, you could either look at our um, website and find those, um, find those links to the cities to see their requirements. Um, with that, I was also trying to look at what other questions we had. Um, another question was with the FEIN number, um, like Kim mentioned, that is through the IRS, um, through if you need that for your employees. Oh, 
And let's see, do we have any other questions? We'll just go over some of the frequently asked questions that we receive. Um, sometimes people ask, um, how do they renew their business license? Um, Basically, if you have any state or city endorsements on your business license, you would uh, renew that with us through the Department of Revenue. Um, how do you add your endorsements to your business license? To add endorsements to a business license, that's done through a business license application. Through the, uh, with the form, you can do it either online or um, by mail. Any other questions? Let's see here. Mm -hmm. Don't see any other questions coming out. There's one. Um, let's see. Sole proprietorship does not register with Secretary of State. Oh, I think that's a response. I'm sorry. Um, does DOR work with LCB when applying for a license for establishing that sells al alcohol? Uh, we do partner with Liquor and Cannabis Board. Um, when you are applying for your license, you for your liquor license, you would apply through our system, um, and that application would then get sent over to our partners, and then our partners would do the approval sign for that. Another question we get sometimes is, can you file your renewal early? Um, you are eligible to file a re your renewal up to two months before the expiration date. And the expiration date is um, annually, so it is printed on your business license. Um, so again, if you have endorsements, such as state endorsements that we partner with or um, city endorsements that are on your application, you would re renew those annually. Another question says, if we are holding a business license, we do not need to register with Secretary of State. Um, again, Secretary of State registration is different from a business license. Um, that is your entity registration. So if you are a entity type that needs to register with Secretary of State and you are uh, located or your business is based out of Washington, you would need to register first with the Secretary of State and then you would register your um, business through the Department of Revenue to get your taxes, tax account and any state or city partners that you may need on that license. Um, sorry, I'm just looking for any more questions. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions. Again, we'll be in live chat um, after this, and you can also find us in the virtual booth. Um, well, have a great day.